This Week in Microbiology, episode number 115, recorded on October 18th, 2015. Hey everybody, I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening and watching to TWIM, the podcast all about life that's unseen on Earth. Now I say watching because if you're listening to this, you can go over to YouTube and find the video because this is a special episode. I'm in La Jolla, California. I'm on the campus of the University of California in San Diego, and I've grabbed two microbiologists here on a Sunday who have joined me, so you should appreciate that very much. And my two guests today are both professors in the section of molecular biology, the Division of Biological Sciences here at UCSD. On my life, on my left, Kit Poliano. Welcome. Hi, thanks for having us. Yeah, my pleasure, thank you. And Joe Poliano, thank Hello. you. Thanks for, for visiting us. And you guys are married, right? We are. All right. Same last name. Makes sense. And we're going to talk a little bit about how it is to have separate labs but still work together. That's an interesting thing that our um, listeners would love to hear. I want to start by hearing about where you guys are from and where you went to school and all that. Let's start with you. You're not a Californian, are you? No, I'm from Washington <laughs> State. Ah. And so I went to the University of Washington. and. Mm -hmm. Um, worked in Gus Dorman's lab in the Department of Genetics and then in Steve Laurie's lab in the Microbiology Department. So already you were into science at that point. I was. I worked in labs when I, as an undergraduate. As soon as I could, I started looking for labs to work in. So I started at, in as high a sophomore. School? In high school? As a sophomore in college. Okay. Were your parents scientists? No. So you just got I just turned got, on by it. Was yeah. it a high school teacher that did it? A high school teacher. My mother also was really into reading popular science okay. when I was growing up. So That's great. Still still around. It right? was absolutely. So you went to UW and you mm -hmm. majored in biology? Mm-hmm. And at what point did you decide you wanted to get a PhD? Probably right when I was a sophomore. I was pretty motivated. I loved research. It was the best thing in the world to be working in the lab and doing experiments. And you never and thought of going to medical school, right? Never. Crossed my mind in a million years. <laughs> Great. Yeah. And where did you go to get your PhD? So I got my PhD at Harvard Medical School mm -hmm. in the, with John Beckwith in the microbiology department. Was the chair Bernie Fields yeah, at the, the time? The chair was Bernie Fields. Yeah. He was a wonderful chair. I knew Bernie because he was a virologist. Of course. He, was, he had a lot of influence on my career, actually. Pathogenesis and all that stuff, yeah. I think it's safe to say he had a lot of a big influence on many of the graduate students in that department and the faculty as well. Hmm. So what year, uh, roughly, are we talking about for your PhD? PhD. What was my PhD? 86 to 93. Did you guys meet in graduate school? We did. So you are in the same lab? Yeah. Okay. Same lab, same project. Really? So you started out by competing and then you said, <laughs> we're not going to compete. So I was in, the, in John's lab, and I was assigned to you know, basically characterize the sec DNF genes and sequence them and fig learn about them. Yeah. And then Joe comes along and joins the lab a few <laughs> years later, and his job was to figure out what these proteins did. And at what point did you start going out and all that stuff right away, or was there a little delay? A couple years in. A couple years? Two years. A couple years in. Yeah. Did you get married before you left the yep. PhD program? You finished about the same time? I finished ahead of Joe. Okay. Did, so you, did I finished, you go off to a postdoc? I went off and did my postdoc then with Rich Losick across also, the street. Also in Boston. Yeah. Also in Boston. Okay. And then Joe finished up his PhD and we moved out here together. So you came directly here from Boston and you've been here ever since. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, we'll talk about your science, but I presume you took a lot of what you were working on there. And brought I it did. Here, right? I did. Including Bacillus subtilis, right? Absolutely. Okay. And Joe, where are you from? I'm from Illinois. I grew up in a small town. There were 44 people in my graduating high school class. I think the high school is now defunct and closed. And so I went to the University of Illinois for my undergrad and from there went to Harvard Medical School. Was Norm Pace there at the time or Carl Woese? Carl Woese was there. Not Norm Yeah, Pace. I would see Carl Woese wandering around the hallways Stan late Stan Malloy night. was there. And Stanley, yeah, so I worked in Stanley Malloy's lab. As an undergraduate. As an undergraduate okay. for several years, yeah. That was a great time. That's right. He told me he had worked in his lab there. Right, right. Yeah. In fact, he's visiting this weekend, I think. I don't know. Yeah. Why. Probably yeah. raising nice. money for SDSU. He does that a lot. He showed up in New York a couple of weeks ago. He was raising money. Mm -hmm. wow. Lots of alums all over. So you, you went to uh, undergrad there and then PhD. And at then Harvard, PhD at Harvard, yeah. With, uh, in John Beckwith's lab. With yeah. same lab yeah. as you were in. Yeah. And then a postdoc. 
With who? And then, well, when, when I finished my PhD, Kit had just finished her postdoc and accepted a job at UCSD. Uh -huh. So my first postdoc was in Kit's lab. It's in your lab. It was awesome. That's cool. Yeah. Now, Kit is your given name at birth? Catherine is my Catherine. given name. So Kit is a endearing. Yeah, my mother decided when she saw Kit. me that I was not a Catherine, I was not a Kathy, I was not Kit. a Kate. That's cool. So what was I became you, Kit. What was your name before Poliano? It was Johnson. Johnson. Okay. Do you like, do you like Poliano? Are you okay with that? I like it. I so, do so, like it. So I met my wife in grad school. We weren't in the same lab. Um, and then I went off to do a postdoc and she stayed in New York and then she did a postdoc in New York and I came and took my position at Columbia there and then we got married but I told her not to take my name because Rack and Yellow is just a terrible burden <laughs> <laughs> and she doesn't complain to this day and so you did your postdoc here and she, did, she told you what to do basically or she gave you a lot of freedom. Um, he was a difficult postdoc. Uh, yeah, it was probably a troublesome <laughs> postdoc. No, uh, it was it was a great experience because, as you know, setting up a lab is a lot of work. Yeah. And for me, I got to see that actually it's it was something that is achievable because I got to help set up a lab from from scratch. So that helped gave, you. It helped me give me the confidence that maybe I could do that someday as well. So is this the lab that you came to when you first came here that we're no, sitting in? No, we were in Bonner Hall, which is one of the original biology buildings. Mm -hmm. And my lab was there for probably the first eight or seven years, thereabouts. Okay. And then this building was built. All right. So now when you went to look for a faculty position, mm -hmm. you just looked here? We ended up looking all over. Oh, both of you looking. Okay. Yeah. And you got something here so you could just stay. That was easy, right? Mm -hmm. But it could have been that you didn't get anything here and you would have have to gone elsewhere. Right? It was the classic <clears throat> dual career job search, yeah. you know, in order to find a position where we could both be happy yeah. and productive, we had to both go on the job market. And then ultimately this place came through and because of the timing, we were able to get adjoining labs in the same beautiful right. new building. Mm -hmm. And your lab is actually, you're all one area. You're both in this one shared mm -hmm. facility, right? And you have yeah. separate offices outside. Mm -hmm. well. mm -hmm. But San Diego is not a bad place for a two career science family, right? There are enough other places that you could go to. Absolutely. Because that's, New York is very good for that. My wife yeah. got a job at Merck actually nearby. And mm -hmm. so we could both work in the New York area. And I think there are a few uh, cities that are pretty good for two careers, but once you get smaller and smaller, then it gets harder <coughs> and harder. Right? Yeah. Okay. So now, do you, do you love San Diego? You're from Washington, you're from Illinois, pretty different. You love it here? I think it's safe to say we love San Diego. It's a <laughs> great place to live and do science. And the campus is incredibly collaborative and communicative. It's, it's just a really fun place to be. We have just great colleagues here on campus at the medical school, at SIO, at SDSU. It really makes for a real strong microbiology community. Yeah, when I was looking, so we, I'm here for SCASM, and we did a podcast yesterday there, and I was looking to do another one here, and I looked at your web page for your department, and I'm looking down and down and down, and I came across your names, and I said, ah, yeah, we've done your papers before on TWIM. Alio really likes you guys, you know. Did you know that? Yeah. I think you work He's with, you, wonderful. You, you teach with We the, teach a yeah. class together. Class here. It's, it's, it's the highlight of my year is teaching a class with Elio. You should hear him talking about it. These guys are amazing. <laughs> <laughs> He's amazing. He's amazing. The cool thing is, is that he retired out here, right? So he spent many years in Boston. Probably you didn't know him because he was at Tufts across town. We right? knew him in yeah. Boston as well. He would serve on students' thesis committees. Okay. And, we, and there was a really tight micro community in Boston as well. Right. I think it's just cool that he came, he retired out here and he, now he can find a science community to be part of. I want to do that at some point, yeah. right? I don't yeah. know where to go, but uh, I think that's just great that he can teach and interact with you guys. You know, Absolutely. he blogs, he podcasts, he's very active. He, is. Mm -hmm. he knows what's going on. Yeah, He really does. Because you ask him questions about, you know, if he does a paper on Twim, man, he, he gets it right. It's really mm -hmm. fabulous. Okay, let's talk about science. Um, before that we do, though, can I say, is it okay to say prokaryotic? <laughs> sure. Because you guys use that in your papers. And Alio... Do we both use it in our mm -hmm. papers? I don't know if you both do. One or the other uses prokaryote, because I've read it in your paper. That must be you. And right. I, on, a long time ago, there was a big... I'm sure you know there was a big discussion. Oh, yeah. Oh, I know. Because yeah. they were originally, right, there were... Um, 
eukaryotes and prokaryotes, and the archaea were lumped in there, and then they were separated, and then someone said we shouldn't call them prokaryotes. Right. And that's, I think the original thing was because they don't have a nucleus, but they do have a nucleoid or something that's condensed. So you're okay with prokaryotes? I prefer bacteria and archaea, yeah, yeah. and Good. the reason, it, and, and eukaryotes, because the machineries of the three types of cells are so diff fundamentally different. I think that the okay. name does really matter. What do you think, Joe? Well, we try to remember to use, to be more specific and use bacteria, bacteria and archaea. Okay, because we have a virology textbook that is in its fourth edition. And the first mm -hmm. two, we used prokaryote. And then the third, I changed them all. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. I was told you shouldn't really say prokaryotes, archaea, mm -hmm. and eukaryotes. Because prokaryote is not really a classification. Right. It's just no, sort it's of not. A, yeah. A morphological statement about the bacteria, so we changed it. So yeah. I just wanted to know because. Yeah. Okay, so I, I um, if I slip into prokaryote, it's just by accident. So I know you've worked a lot with Bacillus subtilis. So if you, mm -hmm. that's from your roots in Boston. Mm -hmm. right? By the way, so we have some <coughs> common friends in science. John Dworkin is a Bacillus subtilis guy. Mm -hmm. Worked in Rich Losick's lab. Yeah, right. He did. And I know Howard Schumann was from, um, what's his name? I'm forgetting. Beckwith. Beckwith's lab, yeah. right? Long time ago, probably before you, you recognized. And my wife did her thesis on Bacillus subtilis. I oh. bet you didn't even have any clue that, you know, that, that I would be even close to Bacillus Oh, subtilis, that's great. Even though it's under my feet, right? <laughs> <laughs> she actually worked on a phage of Bacillus subtilis, phi 105. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You like phages, right? Mm -hmm. Or both, would you say both of you like phages? Or both maybe you need more a little than Yeah, yeah. I, I, so I grew up working on bacteriophage T4. It wow. was my very first project working with Gus Norman. Wow. Uh, but Joe now makes a career of yeah. this, I yeah. think. So a big she, chunk of it. So she work. worked on phi 105, which is a lambdoid of like, because it's got a repressor region and mm -hmm. she did things with that. So, but then she left um, viruses and microbiology, went into parasites. So anyway, so I know a little, there's some bacillus in my blood. No, no, I can't really say that. <laughs> so um, I, there are a bunch of things you got. You guys do so many amazing things. I was looking at your papers and they're amazing topics. So maybe we can touch on a few of them and you can talk about them. So I know sure. you work a lot on sporulation. I do. And so does Jonathan Dworkin. Actually, we interviewed Jonathan uh, for TWIM. He talked about that some time ago. It doesn't mean that I know anything about it, but... Um, so I wanted to ask you, do you think spores are alive? Do I think spores are alive? That's a good question. It's a thought question, right? Or, um, or as Alia would say, it's a Talmudic question, right? With a small t. <laughs> what do you think? I think spores, are they alive? They're not alive until they germinate, I would say, because they're not using ATP. They're not doing much of anything. And I think they are truly dormant. But are they a living organism? I would, I would say yes, and how can I say that? But I would say that because they have the capacity to, to germinate and grow into something. It's not like a virus, which is clearly a biological entity that's not alive. Right. Yeah, we often we talk about whether viruses are living all the time, and spores come up, and seeds. Yes. But they have all the machinery to do something. They do, right? exactly. Whereas a virus needs to sell all the time. So right. I, I can't see that a virus, I, I, I think a, a spore is alive and a seed is, and, but a virus particle is, is not. Okay, you, yeah. you agree with that? Go Absolutely. Yeah. You can disagree, you know. No, no don't worry, you'll, you'll know <laughs> <when> I disagree. <laughs> um, so you, you use bacillus a lot because it sporulates naturally, right? Mm -hmm. So when, when nutrients are limiting, it sporulates and these yep. are highly resistant, they can last a long time. Absolutely. What other, what other bacteria do this? Sporulate, uh, clostridia, clostridia do, right? do this as well. And there yeah. are bacteria, there are uh, Epilopiscum fishaloni makes, does the steps mm -hmm. of spore formation, but doesn't quite make a spore. Instead it makes a cell within a cell kind of a structure. And then it releases a cell that has two membranes on the outside. Okay. And there are, so there's a variety of the close relatives in this one branch of the bacterial tree and the firmicutes that can spores. make spores. Do archaea make spores? Archaea do not make spores. As and far are, as we know, right? As far as, well, there are other kinds of spores. So Streptomyces make spores, mm -hmm. but not by the same pathway. And they don't result in spores that are nearly as durable. Okay. Now you have this, I, I found this great eLife paper that you published about a protein called SPO3E. 
Yeah, I love SPO3E. So SPO means sporulation, right? It so, does. So any gene involved in sporulation, you call it a SPO. That's right. And these have been known for many years, I presume? Yeah. You make mutations, and if mutations in a gene that knocks out sporulation, you call it a SPO, right? That's right. So how many total genes do you need for sporulation? Uh, a few hundred. A few hundred. A few hundred. Oh. There's a lot of genes required to make these spores. And, and during, do you call it vegetative growth? Mm -hmm. Is that, okay. During vegetative growth, these genes have also a function, or they're just limited to sporulation? So, so a few of them have a function. The ones that we know the best about really don't have much of a function during growth at all. In fact, most of them are not even expressed during growth. SPO3E is an exception to this. It is expressed during growth, but it's function during, it's not essential for growth under normal conditions. Okay. This is a, such a cool story. What is oh, SPO3E? Thanks. What does it do? So SPO3E is a protein that sits at the middle of the septum and when the, the cell divides once in a while in a regular vegetatively growing cell, it'll trap a chromosome. And this is a, a protein that, that grabs the protein and pumps the, or grabs the DNA and pumps it out of the septum to clear it out mm. so that both daughter cells get a chromosome. Now during, mm. this happens only rarely during in normal growing mm -hmm. cells because the septum comes down in the middle and the chromosomes are kind of out of the way most of the time. But during sporulation, you have a highly asymmetrically positioned septum that closes down mm -hmm. over the septum every single time, leaving 70% of it in the wrong cell. And so the SPO3E protein assembles at the septum and pumps the chromosome across the septum. Meanwhile, the cell is getting ready to sporulate, and it's expressing one set of proteins in one cell and the other in the other cell. And so spo 3 also sits there and keeps those cells separated so they can mm. begin to achieve their different fates that so, they need to develop. So it's a channel through the membrane? It's a channel. Right. It's a channel through the membrane. And one of the big puzzles that's about spo 3 is how it has to transport the chromosome across two membranes, one for each of the two nascent daughter cells. And how do you assemble a channel right. that, that can traverse traverse two membranes. So I'm not supposed to ask why questions, but sometimes it's easier <clears throat> to say why than to rephrase it. But why would you do sporulation in such a way to leave a lot of DNA behind? Why isn't it all partitioned at one end and then you yeah. make the spore? So I think it's because the spore starts out so tiny. It is 10% ah, okay. or thereabouts of mm -hmm. the total volume of that cell. And there's no way to pack a chromosome okay. that normally okay. takes up 50 or 40% or 30% of the cell into one 10% okay. volume. And so it's easier to pump it in and use your ATP just to shove it across the membrane. So as soon as the spore is made, the SPO3 gets put into the, the two membranes, right? Yep. And is it a pump? Is it actually an energy it is. using pump? It uses ATP and it assembles a hexamer, and the hexamer uses one ATP for wow. every couple of nucleotides that it moves. So it churns through a lot of ATP. So you said that part of the DNA is in the spore and parts in the uh, other, in the main part of the cell, but this is one big circle of DNA, it right? Is. Does it get broken so that it can be no. slithered in or? So we, what we <laughs> think happens is that it assembles two side-by-side -side channels, one for mm -hmm. each arm of the chromosome, and then it pumps it through and what happens at the end when that last little loop gets up to the septum is yes. not exactly clear. <clears throat> but one model that, mm. that we like is that um, we, when the septum assembles, you have to, the, it closes down and then you assemble these two side-by-side -side rings. And we think that it's possible that at the end the, it kind of disassembles to let that loop through. Sure. Again, that's one model. Could it be cleaved and then it could be like cleaved. A, like that's, a topo isomer that's the other right? beautiful model is that you keep the channels as they are, but then you chop it on one side and stick it back together on the other side. Okay. That, there so that's a beautiful, that sort of yeah, that's a beautiful model as well. SV40 replication circle. When you replicate DNA, it gets all super coiled and you have yep. to periodically cleave it to release. Absolutely. And then re-ligate it. That's cool. a, so, so is this, a, is this both 3 e like the, the motors that pack DNA at the phage heads? It's have some structurally similar it to is. those motors, absolutely. And it's also like FTSK, which is an E. coli protein that also rescues chromosomes trapped in septa. Mm -hmm. Once in a while, when a cell replicates its chromosome, you end up with either a catamer, a concatenate, or a right. dimeric chromosome. And SPO3 helps the cell deal with those. Okay. Do you still work on SPO3E? I do. What's, yeah. What do you want to know about what it? What do I want to know about it? So. So we hypothesize that this protein assembles paired channels. That is, it mm -hmm. has a, a membrane ring at one, in each cell, in each membrane, and then the ATPase assembles in each of the two cells. And we would really like to see that paired channel in a living cell. Mm -hmm. 
Are the data we've published so far certainly is consistent with that, and I think that's the most parsimonious explanation for our data, but it's not, and uh, it's not exactly seeing it. And the other thing we'd like to know is how it is that you communicate across this member, the septum, so that only one channel is active, mm -hmm. only one pump is active in one cell. Because otherwise, if you have them fighting against each other, you won't be able to move the DNA in the right direction. So you do all this in B subtilis, but do other bacteria have a SPO3E like they this? They do. All, all, all the spore, spore formers All do? spore formers have a SPO3E molecule. Okay. And in fact, almost all bacteria have an FTSK-like molecule that's required to rescue the dimeric and catameric chromosomes. So you, also, you said also SPO3E plays a role in cell division when the chromosome is, is not evenly divided, right? So you would yes. think other bacteria need that all the time too, right? That's right. So do they have some other protein that serves the same function? Uh, yeah, possibly? they all, FTSK is a close relative that yeah. serves the same function. Okay. So this is Kit's work, right? You don't collaborate on this aspect of, no, you don't, you don't no. publish this together. Do you ever talk about it? Do I ever talk about with it? Kit, with Kit, <laughs> I'm just curious. I think even our kids could talk about it at this point. Really? <laughs> talk, about the, talk about science at home? Yeah, yeah I think uh, we kind of overdo it sometimes. Unfortunately yeah. for our yeah. teenager. Do they, they, does your kids say enough ever? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Don't you think? They're, they, they just kind of try to tune us out. Yeah, usually know? they go read a book or go do their homework or put yeah. their headphones on. Yeah. So you guys have adjoining <laughs> offices, right? So on a typical day, do you, do you talk a lot or not much? Give me an idea. Varies. Varies. We tend to talk a fair amount. Yeah. But you don't have a set meeting time or anything like that. Do you have joint lab meetings? We do have joint lab meetings. It makes yeah. sense, I would guess. And we carpool. <laughs> yes, you do. Well, that makes sense. You don't want to drive separately, right? right? So you have to both come at the same time and leave at the same time. And so if you have a thorny issue, would you then say, Joe, what do you think about this? Because he's working on the same field he should know, right? Absolutely. You know, certainly all the science mm -hmm. issues we always talk about mm -hmm. together. But you keep the sporulation yours separate, mm -hmm. right? So is that important to have when you have a couple working at a university in adjacent labs, how important it is to keep separate uh, projects like that? Well, certainly, you know, Joe has his, his cytoskeleton project that he has right. kept separate as well. And certainly we were almost entirely separate until just recently, right before you became a full professor, I think. Yeah. So I think it's important, certainly, as you're coming up to tenure, right. to keep completely yeah. independent. So initially, we didn't collaborate at all when we had our lab side by side here. Cause you were probably paranoid to collaborate at all, right? Because you were worried that it wouldn't be looked upon well when you came up for tenure. Yeah, right? yeah, exactly. But then once you're both tenured, then you can do whatever you want. Exactly. So how do you decide what to collaborate on? Because you do share some papers, and then some are separate. Just how it falls or? I think it's, do you want to answer that one? You've been quiet. You talk yeah, more. Well, it, it just depends upon the projects. I mean, yeah. we try to keep our phage cytoskeletal projects. So far, those have all been separate. Just some, a couple of people in my lab work on it. Yeah. It has her sporulation <clears throat> projects, people in her lab. You know, she has her own separate grant on that and I have my own separate grant on the phage. And it's kind of nice to have something that's separate. Sure. You have, do you share a grant together? Do you have any? We do share a grant together. So as we've moved more, our work has moved more into translational science, and that project is soundly shared okay. between the two of us. Got and it. I think that really helps us learn the new fields that we're entering into a little bit more quickly, because so we can learn it together. Okay. All right, I'm going to come back to you, but I want to talk to Joe so he's not quiet, OK? We'll Thank you. About his I like being quiet. So you like being quiet? <laughs> I bet you'd love to talk about your work. Sure. Um, one of the things you do on your own is the cytoskeleton. Mm -hmm. We've done your papers. In fact, on one, one of our twins was called Not Unorganized Bags of Enzymes. That was Alio's title. Awesome. Mm -hmm. He said, they're not unorganized bags of enzymes. They have a cytoskeleton. And so that wasn't discovered very long ago, right? Not that long ago. And as time has gone on, we're finding more and more different types of cytoskeletal proteins. So in eukaryotic cells, we have actin filaments around the periphery, right? Mm -hmm. And then the microtubules go into the center. They help the cells divide. And mm -hmm. basically similar things in bacteria? S similar, yeah. In fact, we've, in, with uh, bacteriophage, we've now found our first example of a bipolar spindle. Right. Sort of set up of a tubulin-based That's fuzzy, system. right? How do you yeah, pronounce fuzz. it? Fuzz? We call it fuzz. Figure. 
Yeah. What, is this, what does PHU stand for? Well, we started out for like phage, tubulin, okay. like TUBZ or FTSC. So. Fuzz. Fuzz is good. Yeah. Fuzz. You know, the, the, the Drosophila people always give their genes cool names, right? right. You have to do that too. Um, so the fuzz is a phage-encoded microtubule-like protein. Phage-encoded tubulin, yeah. And tubulin. It, make, it doesn't make a microtubule. It makes a sort of unique triple-stranded okay. stand, triple polymer. In fact, you, you got the structure of this triple strand, right? Yeah, our collaborator, Dave Agard at yep. UCSF, we've had this wonderful collaboration where we're, we do the in vivo work and he does the structure yes. and the biochemistry. It's been a lot of fun. How many total cytoskeletal proteins do you use B. subtilis or you use other bacteria as well? We, our policy has been to work on anything that we think is interesting. So if we think there's a new type of cytoskeletal element in there, we might get it out and start working on it. So roughly how many cytoskeletal proteins are there? There's lots. 10, 100? Keep going. Really? It, well, wow. so it depends on what you call a kind of cytoskeletal protein. So how, how many kinds of actins are there and what kind of processes do they yeah, participate lots. in? Yeah. Hundreds so, or thousands. Yeah, right. probably many. All right, so it's a respectable cytoskeleton. Very respectable. It deserves to be viewed just like eukaryotic cytoskeleton. It's where, it's where the eukaryotic cytoskeleton came from. Yes, of course, yeah. as we did as well, right? Yeah. How did we not see it for so long, right? It doesn't show up in EM when you just do a thin section and stain. You don't see it. But if you stain with antibodies, you can see beautiful Antibodies or GFP fusions, you can see them. So if you could take some of the major cytoskeletal components and stain bacteria, what, what would it look like? A, a meshwork with fibrils like eukaryotic cells? You probably have done this, right? Or well, it, it would, it, again, so there are many, many kinds of actins and tubulins out there, but they're not all in one cell. So in E. coli, you might find, you know, some FTSC polymers, mm -hmm. some MREB polymers. If they have a plasmid or a couple of plasmids, they'll have a couple of actin type filaments that elongate and push the plasmids apart. So. And, you, and you can disrupt each of these genes and see the effect on division or morphology and so mm -hmm. forth. Right? Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and so you, you're being, you don't know all of them, but you probably have a, a good idea what each of them does. So for example, do some, are some specific for cell division and partitioning of DNA? Some are specific for cell division. Some are specific for cell shape. shape. If, you, if you look at the cytoskeletal elements that have evolved on mobile elements, so plasmids and phage, there's a huge variety of them. And we don't know what all of those do. Bioinformatically, you can identify them because right, they have all the right. signatures. But so, then testing and proving what they do is, takes a while. Oh, well, that's okay though, right? Yeah, that's fine. We like to do experiments. So is it safe to say that a coccus is different from a bacillus because of the cytoskeleton and a spirulum, right? Well, because of the or, peptidoglycan, which right. does the cell wall, and which, and which is dependent upon actin-like proteins. For their so it contributes shape. to the shape. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Now the the phage uh, fuzz, right? Yeah. Wh why does the phage need this? Why can't it use a host fuzz? Well, that's a good question. So the phage that we've worked on that have this uh, tubulin, the the bacteria doesn't have a tubulin like this in the cell, so it has to have its own. But then the question is, why does it have to have one? And these phages that have it are very large in size, mm -hmm. 300, 400, 500 KB, so they're approaching the size of a small or a minimal bacterial genome. And they use the tubulin to organize replication and assembly of the virus. Okay. So the, the viral DNA is, is organized by filaments made up of fuzz? Basically. Yeah. I think in one of your papers you had a picture and the fuzz is attached at both ends of the bacterium and the phage mm -hmm. DNA is replicating in the middle. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. And we now know that all the phage proteins involved in assembling the capsids and the tails, etc., all accumulate sort of in a sphere around where the DNA is replicate, replicating. <clears throat> so the yeah. fuzz network is just making a platform for the replication and assembly to happen on? The fuzz, the fuzz network makes a spindle where you have in the cell, you have a sort of a, a number of filaments that reach from the pole and elongate and move towards the center. We think they serve as a driving force for localizing proteins or the, the DNA itself in the center. If you do that from both sides. Do you think that it has a role in packaging also? We don't know if it has a role in packaging. We don't have any evidence for that. 
it might have a role in getting the enzymes needed for packaging right. there. But we don't know that yet either. We're currently looking for proteins that interact with the with the tubulin. I was, yeah, you were, I think you said that the protein that attaches the fuzz to the ends, you're looking for that one. And we're right? looking for that one too. And how do you do that by interaction screens and biochemistry? And that well, sort of we. We, we have taken an approach where we're using mass spec just to look at the proteins that are produced by the phage, mm -hmm. and then we're tagging them all with GFP. So we're looking for ones that are localizing you know, to that very right. pole of the cell. And then we're finding other ones that localize to this nucleoid, to this phage nucleoid. Nice. Do, you, do uh, archaea also have cytoskeletons? I would guess. Right? I'm, uh, they absolutely do, yeah. People have people <clears throat> studied that. Yeah, they've, they've worked a lot on FTSZ. I don't know if, you're, if you know about the giant eukaryotic viruses mm -hmm. that have been discovered. virus? Mimi virus, yeah. Pandora viruses with huge genomes, right? Yeah. I, want, I was just thinking, reading this story, whether those viruses would encode cytoskeletal components. Because they have tRNAs, tRNA synthetases, mm -hmm. things, things that have never been found in viruses before. A cytoskeletal protein could be interesting to help because yeah. a lot of these, some, some of them replicate in the nucleus, but some also replicate in the cytoplasm. Mm -hmm. You can imagine that maybe you need yeah. a, a new Absolutely. cytoskeletal protein Neat. to do that. So you use traditional <clears throat> bacterial methods to do your work, but you also use biochemistry mm -hmm. and a lot of microscopy, mm -hmm. right? Is there any kind of special microscopy that you do? I bet there is, because right? you have beautiful pictures. It's your turn to talk. Oh. Yeah, so we, we use uh, fluorescence microscopy, right. and we've worked for a large number of years getting our cells to really be happy and alive when we're doing live cell microscopy. Mm. We use deconvolution microscopy, which removes the out of plane light. And so it basically you can do, we do optical sectioning, and mm -hmm. then there's a mathematical program that's applied to your image that reassigns the light to the right focal plane. And provided your images are collected appropriately, and that is right. you're free of optical artifacts that can really clean up your images in an amazing way and improves resolution and mm -hmm. sensitivity. So is this what's the called super resolution microscopy? This is not super resolution. That's this different. is just straight deconvolution microscopy. Okay. But we do also do super resolution microscopy. We have on campus, there's a structured illumination microscope, mm -hmm. which is very much like deconvolution, but you put, impose a pattern on the light, and then that gives you a little more information for the math to work. So did you, uh, when you guys were in your postdocs, did you do microscopy then, or is this something you've learned here? I pretty much learned it as a postdoc yeah. in Rich Losick's lab. That was right at the very beginning of this revolution and how we saw bacterial cells. And Lucy Shapiro had just published a paper showing that the chemoreceptor proteins were localized at the pole mm -hmm. of gram-negative bacteria, and we started applying that to bacillus. And so that was really that was really a huge, hugely fun time in Rich's lab. I think there were a number of fun times there. But. Microscopy has just exploded, right? Conventional micro, not electron, but conventional. Absolutely, it's it can do so much more, and that really is a lot of what you do is based on that. Absolutely, we also do photo bleaching to look at protein dynamics and mm -hmm. turf microscopy to watch the individual proteins move around the cell. Right. So the so fuzzy, use, fuzzy, you look at where it is in the cell and so forth by these techniques, right? Mm -hmm. Beautiful pictures. This eLife paper, no, that's your paper. Mm -hmm. But some of these papers are open access, so our mm -hmm. listeners can go check them out and see beautiful pictures that you made. Yeah, the, the eLife paper was a nice collaboration with Carlos Bustamante at Berkeley. Mm -hmm. And he built a palm microscope for super resolution and has an algorithm for counting the molecules accurately. So, I mean, it's really, really fun collaborating with him. So, you mentioned that you're getting more translational, so maybe we could move a little bit into that. And one of the, um, so here's the segue. When we did your paper on bacterial cytological profiling on a TWIM, uh, Elio presented that a while ago. He was just going poetic over it, right? <laughs> this is where you, I'm going to let you describe it. But that may be a segue into this. <coughs> is that a collaboration, the cytolog cytological mm -hmm. profiling? Absolutely. Right? Done between both of you. So. What is it? What is bacterial cytological profiling? Can I make you talk? Right? Oh, sure. <laughs> so it's, it's using, it's, it's basically collecting images of bacteria and then measuring a variety of different parameters and defining what a wild type cell looks like with all of these measurements. And, and your then, microscopy is so good that you can do you that. You have right? to have excellent microscopy and you have to have the highest resolution and you have to have cells that are alive. 
And then in the case of uh, different sets of treatment, it could be different growth or it could be different antibiotics. Um, we can see if there's a difference in that cell by making the same measurements but under a different condition. That's sort of the basis of cytological profiling. And you found that the different classes of antibiotics that hit cell wall or translation or whatever else have different morphological effects, right? Yeah, amazingly, every single compound we've looked at, it doesn't matter what kind it is, it could be a small molecule, a natural product, you know, some kind of peptide mimetic of an antimicrobial peptide. If they target a different pathway in the cell, they generate a different and unique cytological signature that we can distinguish from the others. It's incredibly powerful. I need to know how you thought of doing this because it's not obvious that it would work, right? Do you remember what? Oh yeah, yeah. We both have different stories. Want to tell your story? Yeah. So, so we I both was... started working on it at the same time, and without each other knowing it. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, and in, in my case, there were two key collaborations that led in that direction. One was with Jonathan Dworkin, your colleague, really? and wow. he was playing around with antibiotics and sporulation, seeing mm -hmm. if cell wall biosynthesis was required for sporulation or for right. engulfment. And he found that it was, and we were treating cells with different antibiotics, and I realized that they were starting to look really different. Okay. And so that was kind of clue one on my part. And then clue two came from my colleague here, Peter Dorstein, who um, does MALDI imaging, where he can look and see all the natural products that a, an organism is making when it interacts with another organism. Mm -hmm. And he had purified two molecules that he thought were involved in Bacillus subtilis cannibalism based on the fact that it was distributed around the colony that was killing its neighbor um, and in the right distribution. Right. And he handed us 20 microliters of these things and said, tell me which one is the cannibalism toxin. And so we then started playing around with these molecules hmm. and found that one of them killed bacillus. And then we kind of realized we needed to do some control compounds as we went. That's where the and that was, those were kind of the two first clues. And then I, we were both on sabbatical. Uh -huh. the same year and started doing experiments in the lab ourselves. You, went, you both actually. went away together on sabbatical? But we were here. Oh, I see. So we stayed here. And so we were in the lab doing experiments. I see. And one day I wanted to see what would happen to my favorite actin polymer if I threw in <coughs> chloramphenicol or tetracycline or ampicillin. I want to see, does this, do, would this polymer require you know, ATP or protein mm -hmm. synthesis to continue doing what it was doing? So I started throwing into some of these drugs, and then one afternoon, I'll never forget it, I looked at these cells, it's like, oh my god. Every cell that I've added a different antibiotic to has a really different morphology. This is clearly going to be a way to, dis, to, to understand what antibiotics are doing. Right. Because, I mean, I'm throwing in protein synthesis inhibitors. I mean, who would have thought that you could see something different in a exactly. bacterial yep. cell with fluorescence microscopy? Everybody thought, well, the resolution's too low. Yeah. There's not much to see. No, that's the amazing part, is that it's such a simple premise, but it works. Mm -hmm. This is why it's important to let scientists just, like you said, I just wanted to see what happened, yeah. right? Yeah. It doesn't have to be hypothesis-driven yeah. all the time. No, there was no hypothesis. No. It's like, well, let's just go yeah, take and a we, look. And we just both started playing around in the lab that summer, I think it was one summer we were yeah. playing in the lab yeah, together. Well, just and let, doing some an experiment that maybe you wouldn't want to set a graduate student off on that you want to graduate someday, right? The risky faculty experiments. So it was important to do a sabbatical to get this going, really, so you could come Absolutely. in here. Because normally you don't have a lot of time. You probably don't work in the lab at all, I assume? I don't work in the lab at all. I had a bench over here for a while, but it was kind of a joke. And same not, with you. Not anymore. I don't you did until I did. Recently. I did, and especially during those early years, I was having such fun with the antibiotics that uh, I did a lot. So sabbatical was a year or less. Mm -hmm. yeah. A year. And then you went back, and but that project was started. So what? So I was just at Schasm, and I heard a talk about the necessity to improve. Um, bacterial susceptibility testing. Mm -hmm. So a person comes in with sepsis and they get a blood culture. It takes about five days to know exactly what antibiotic you should be using. Yeah. And, and this was a talk by Romney Humphreys. Mm -hmm. You guys should get in touch with her. She said for every hour that you delay in giving the patient the right antibiotic, the life expectancy decreases 5%. Can you imagine? It's terrible. Yeah. It's so they, terrible. So they need to be able to do rapid diagnosis. So I was just thinking maybe your, your approach could do that. Because if there are only so many different ways the bacteria look with an antibiotic, if it's resistant, it's not going to respond, right? Mm -hmm. 
if protein synthesis inhibitor makes it do a certain thing, that won't happen if it's resistant. So you just find the ones that... So is your approach viable for that sort of thing? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, we've got a student working on it for how many years? Quite a few years, and she's got a paper, one paper that's currently under review. Yeah, do you want to just, you should talk about it. It's a really nice is story. Is this the Staph aureus story? Yeah, this there? is Staph aureus. So we have a bioengineering student in our lab, Diana Quatch, and she has found that you, uh, you can use BCP for a rapid susceptibility test that within one hour after you've cultured it, you can, with no errors, tell the difference between drug sensitive and drug resistant Staph aureus. So MRSA, MSSA, mm -hmm. also daptomycin sensitive or resistant. Wow. Just by uh, the morphology. With, just by the morphology. And you can furthermore separate the MRSA strains into two strains that um, correlate with susceptibility to combinatorial drug treatment. So there's two set, two versions of MRSA, mm -hmm. um, one of wow. which you can treat with combinations of beta-lactams or things mm -hmm. that hit the cell wall. This is a young lady who works right behind yeah, us Yeah, right here, here yeah. who was here, who's here today her on a Sunday. Here. Yeah. These are her slides and some cultures probably. Right. So she's. This is fabulous. This is really. I mean, I, this meeting is mostly clinical microbiologists, mm -hmm. and it's really important. This is a big deal. It's. You know, part of, the other yeah. part of the story was she. She said that uh, if you if you ask a typical house staff what a carbapenemase is, they don't know. This yeah. is an enzyme involved yeah. in resistance to carbapenems. I'm not telling you that. I'm, <laughs> for our audience, but there's just such a need for better uh, control of resistance. Yeah. And, yeah. So you, you, uh, so Alio had said that when he discussed this paper that you started a company to move this forward. Is that right? How's that going? That's going well. When we when we found you know that we could learn about mechanism, mm -hmm. we called up some of our friends mm -hmm. who are many of whom work in the pharmaceutical industry, and we said this is, you know, we think we've got something here. But for years they had told us, you know, you academics always think you just have discovered something <laughs> new. That's great. And we discovered that 20 years ago and right. it didn't work. Right. So the first thing I did was call up some of our friends and they said, wow, yeah, that's, that's really incredible. How can we start using this technology like mm -hmm. tomorrow? So, so you, what's the name of the company? Linnaeus Bioscience. Linnaeus. Yeah. And his employees? Yeah. So where is it here? So it's located at the Janssen Labs incubator space. Right. Okay. So at, at the time, nice. so at the time we we made this discovery and we started talking to our friends. They wanted to use it, and so we founded the company. And right at that moment, J the incubator space had opened up, and so we applied and said, "Well, we've got a we've got a plan. People are going to pay us to to help discover the next penicillin." And they said, "Sure, come on in." So we've been there, been in business for three years, nice. and we have a couple of SBIR grants that you know are also funding the company and a lot of interest, and it's. Are you involved in this as well? I am. It's primarily Joe's. This is his extra science, extracurricular <laughs> activity is the company. His industry outreach, is we call it. the industry <laughs> outreach <laughs> part. That's good. That's great. Yeah. I, help, I do help with the writing the SBIR grants and yeah. things. So the idea would be to have, to use these morphological observations as a test for antibiotics. Absolutely. So, so to make a commercially viable test. And this is interesting. Romney said yesterday, it's really important that whatever test you develop has to be reproducible, obviously, Absolutely. and people have to be able to do it because mm -hmm. clinical microbiologists are going to be doing mm -hmm. it day Absolutely. in and day has to be reproducible, easy right. to do, easy to read, and so forth. Right. Absolutely. She went through a whole list of tests and that are under development, and at this meeting, the companies with these tests were there, mm -hmm. and there, some of them are pretty wacky. Um, you probably know one of them is it weighs the bacteria, yeah. and you can tell the species and whether it's sensitive or not because it stops growing. By the way, they have these little micro capillaries. Yeah, those are pretty she cool. Called it, she called it uh, a diving board. The bacteria hit the diving board. You can tell, you know about this? You yeah, about this? I know about those. They're pretty amazing. So I, I, I like your approach. Looking at it under a microscope is easy. And that can be automated, right? It can yeah. be automated and it's quantitative. You don't need to know anything about the nice. genotype or even what the species is. So. It's really flexible. So, you know, for people out there in science who might someday be interested in starting a company based on what they've developed, um, what you have some advice for them? Is it something that you should not do, or do you think it's a great experience? Oh, I, I think you should definitely go for it. If, you're, if you think you've got an idea, yeah, you should, yeah, definitely. It's been, for me, it's been a lot of fun. I've learned yeah. a lot. And I think it's probably some of the most fun I've had in the last five years was <laughs> because it's different challenges. Yeah. You know. 
So do you go to the company and have meetings and talk to your scientists and so forth? And, yeah, yeah, pop by, you know, once every other week or something and find out how it's going. And You know, ASM has, I think it's upcoming, we did some ads for it on some of our shows. They have a, a, a webinar or, or some kind of seminar at headquarters where they teach you how to start a company. Mm -hmm. People who have done it come in and say, okay, here's are the, these are the things that nice. you have to go through. So someday you can do that. You'll have, That's great. You'll have brought it to fruition. But you still want to just do your research, right, forever. You don't want to be a company person all the time. Mm -hmm. Well, we love our research, and we love having the teaching that we do. We teach freshmen mm -hmm. to isolate bacteriophage and characterize them. And in fact, this year, they're also isolating bacteriophage and the host that they infect, Streptomyces, from, right. the, foil, from the soil. And so... Yeah, that's, that's pretty special, too. So I meant to ask you, as I was looking in, you're on a, so is this the Graham Hatful? It is. Uh, yeah. Phage Discovery Program? Yeah, you're part exactly. of that. Yeah. We are. So you, these are high school kids that are college kids that are doing it? We do college, college freshmen, you, but we do that, do some uh, outreach to local high schools as well. Yeah, because a lot of people, I mean, he's seeded people all over the country. They, a lot of high school kids, New York City, they take mycobacteria. I think smegmatis, mm -hmm. not dangerous, right? And they go in soil and they get phages and they sequence them, they annotate it, yeah. they give them a name. Yeah. So that you do similar things, but with a different species, right? Yeah, so we just started using streptomyces, streptomyces this year. So in the past, we'd always done mycobacterium smegmatis as well. And we add a, we add a proteomics component to the course as well, yeah. using mass spec to look at the proteins that they make. And this year we're looking for antibiotic producing bacteria. And so we'll have the students seeing if they kill, and then they can actually do some of our bacterial cytological yeah. profiling on the ones that's that That's safe kill. enough to do, right? Yeah, yeah, that's easy. We'll just have Fabulous. them use an E. coli lab strain, so it'll be right. beautiful. So is this officially, what is this called, C-phages? C-phages. program, right? Yeah, we call it the phage genomics research course. But what is, what is his role? He just inspired you, and now you do it on your own, basically? Or is there still he some He still curates the light. He organizes the sequencing and I curates see. the library and the database of, of all of the phage mm -hmm. that are sequenced through the program. Yeah, yeah, that's great. He does suggest different hosts if you're interested in branching out and he's Okay. So he is cool. really pushing the our understanding of the diversity and evolution of the phage. I, I it's gave really neat. many years ago I gave a talk in Edinburgh about science communication and he was in the audience. And he said, why don't you do this for phages? And I said, why don't you come on my show and talk about it? So, said, okay. so then we got back to the States and yeah. we did. And we had him on. He talked about this. We called it a fireside chat. Awesome. Because it used to be called the fire program, right? Mm -hmm. right. Now, now he changed. You know, he has a podcast that he yeah. does periodically with the people in the program. Oh, that's they, neat. They all get together and they talk. It's very geeky, though. You, you know, if you're in the program, it's great. But it's not meant for a general yeah. audience because they talk about annotating and all the data and stuff yeah. like that. It's a fabulous course. So you, you also teach here, right? Mm -hmm. You teach undergraduates? Mm -hmm. And um, what, this is the course that Alio is involved with, is that correct? What is it about? Is it oh, this is oh, that's, a, that's a graduate course. That's a graduate course? Okay. Yeah, so the undergraduate course, where in the, in the fall they isolate the phage, in the spring they do the annotation. We teach that together as well. Um, and but in the graduate course, uh, it's a pa mostly a paper reading course where we have different instructors, mm -hmm. well, different scientists from around San Diego come in, and we'll present a half hour and then about a topic, and then a student will get up and present a paper, and we all discuss it. But it's a lot of fun because Elio's there, I'm there, the the uh, guest lecturer who's the expert on the topic is there, so you get a lot of different does, perspectives. Does Stan Malloy participate? Stan Malloy participates. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all the microbiologists in the You've area. Got a area pretty rich selection here. Very rich. Right. Do. Right. Yeah. It's wonderful. You get not only academics, but you have all these <clears throat> companies, right, that you can draw from mm -hmm. as well. And, and the weather's not bad. Not yeah. a bad place to work, right? It's okay. A um, <laughs> couple of other things. Oh, yes. Here's two other kind of side things I wanted to mention because it helps bring our podcast together. Um, we did a paper, and you were on this paper, where I think it was... Um, I can't remember the PI, but the idea was that phage in your mucus is a part of your immune system. Mm -hmm. Who was the PI on uh, that? Forest rower. Forest rower, right. Yeah. You remember that? Yeah. I know, you, I know you were in the middle there, so you mm -hmm. probably... What did you do in that paper? Uh, we mostly helped with the microscopy end of it. Okay. Looking at phage diffusion in the mucus. That was so that was TWIM-59, yeah. where 
we have phages in our mucus lining, our mm -hmm. respiratory and our GI tract, obviously. Mm -hmm. but the ones up here may grab bacteria and lyse them. That's pretty mm -hmm. cool. Yeah, that is cool. Natural immunity, why not? Yeah. Why not? I like that. The other thing I found going through your papers, so I have a podcast called This Week in Parasitism. Mm -hmm. We talk about helminths a lot. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So you were on the paper where you took an anti-helminth protein. Yeah. So this is a paper with Rafi Arroyan. Okay. So Rafi was at UCSD, and he just moved to UMass. Um, and the idea was that to take anti-helminth proteins and express them into edible bacillus. Right. So they're... And you, they ba you basically spoilate them, and they become crystals, right? Mm -hmm. It's sort of like BT that yeah, you yeah, throw exactly. on your grass is the same idea, Yeah, right? it's like BT for humans. And there are edible bacillus species? We eat you them, bet. Right? Oh, we yeah. Eat? Why don't you describe the... Yeah, so um, <laughs> natto is a bacillus subtilis fermentation product eaten in Japan. Right. And so these are these natto. beans that are then all super stringy, and the goopy stringiness is actually the exopolysaccharide from the bacillus. Strains, the stuff that they use wow. to glue themselves into a biofilm. So what is this anti, it's just a protein that he discovered is anti-helminth. What is the origin of that protein? Well, they're, no, they're really widespread. Okay. So, um, and, and I mean, it's a huge diverse sort of super family of proteins and some of them will target uh, helminths, some of them will target flies, et cetera. It's, so the idea was to take ones that are kind of more specific for these terrible worms and right. express them in Bacillus subtilis natto, which is not a, a small challenge. You would think it'd be trivial to do, but those organisms are sort of difficult to deal with genetically. Is that what you did? And that's what, that was our role, yeah. But yeah. you got it to work, you got the gene. We were, we were getting expression, yeah, and then uh, Rafi was testing them in various model that's systems. Pretty cool, I like that. Yeah. The, the yeah. idea would be to first go in an animal model, I presume, show it works, and then yeah. Yeah. clinical trials. Mm -hmm. I know, I know from doing TWIP that worms are a big deal. Of all yeah. These different they are. Worms are problematic. Hundreds of millions of people, right? Yeah. Infected. Yeah. The Gates Foundation funded this work, and of course, like most of their projects, they want something that's really inexpensive yeah. Yeah. that you can deploy in a low resource setting. And so this seemed perfect. Basically, sporulated cultures producing tons of these anti helma proteins. It's very cool. I like that. So I wanted to Idea. bring it up and. Yeah. Maybe we'll talk about it on a future, even though it's older. We'll... Yeah, you should talk to, Ra talk to Rafi. Where did he move to? You, you said he UMass. left? Massachusetts. Massachusetts? Amherst? I think UMass Amherst. Yeah. So, you're, uh, so he came to you and said, could you clone this gene in? And you're fine. You're happy to do that? We're, we're happy to work on interesting projects. As, you, know, you asked earlier about cytoskeletal proteins. We would work on anything. Archaea, we don't care. If, if, it's, an inter if it's interesting, and you know, we think there's something to learn or maybe there's some practical, important application, we go for it. It has to be prokaryotic, right? <laughs> bacterial. bacterial. <laughs> it has to be bacterial or archaea, yeah. So, you, you've done some archaeo projects? We tried. We tried working with Haloverix Volcania years, years, years ago, but we didn't get very far. Hmm. So they're very interesting, especially their viruses. Amazing, yeah. yeah. Which I know a guy in uh, Portland State, he works on some viruses are archaea that grow in hot springs and the, their water baths have polyethylene glycol because the water would evaporate, because it's at oh, 90, wow. 90 degrees centigrade, it would evaporate too quickly. Can you imagine PEG? Yeah. Uh, antifreeze, right? Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> in there. Is there anything that we missed that would be really cool to tell people that you're working on or that you want to talk about? Because we've covered a lot. We've covered a lot. Give people a nice idea of the cool things that are going on in your lab. You're happy? I think it's good. This yeah. will be the Poliano. Um, this will illustrate your research for years to come now. This episode will become famous. <laughs> <Not that. laughs> you look skeptical. I'm suddenly frightened. <laughs> no, no, no. You did very well. It was great. It was great. So this episode of TWIM. You can find it on iTunes. You can also find it at microbeworld.org slash TWIM. If you have an iPhone or Android device, there are apps that you can use. They're called podcatchers. You can subscribe to the feeds and get these podcasts for free and listen to them anywhere. So please do, because you can learn a lot. It's a lot of fun. If you have questions or comments, send them to twim at twiv.tv. I want to thank you guys for joining me today. 
Kit Pogliano here at UCSD. Thank, Thank you so much. You. Thank you for coming. My pleasure. I know it's Sunday and <laughs> probably wanted to stay home, but I really appreciate it. Yeah, we're happy and to I be think here. our audience will appreciate it too. Joe Pogliano also here at UCSD. Thank you so much. Thank you. We appreciate it. Stanley will be happy that he did this mm -hmm. as well. Because, <laughs> you know, Stanley's a big um, fan of communicating science, mm -hmm. right? So he likes this and yeah. he's a big supporter. And I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I want to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIM. Chris Kandayan's always a big help. And Ray Ortega. And guess what? He's right here. Thank you, Ray. He's our cameraman, <laughs> our editor, our sound guy, and the producer. So thank you uh, very much, Ray. And thank you, ASM, for sending Ray out here to SCASM and out here to UCSD. <laughs> The music that you hear at the beginning and end of TWIM is composed and performed by Ronald Jenkies. You can hear his work at ronaldjenkies.com. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology. Diana is doing a rapid susceptibility test on Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and this experiment is, is showing that they're sensitive to meropenem, and that causes the cells to elongate and swell up in the middle and get permeabilized. So she is looking into our deconvolution microscope at, at a slide with stained cells that have been stained just really simply with just three different fluorescent dyes. We use different wavelengths of excitatory light to show, see each of the different fluorescent stains. And with those three fluorescent dyes, she can easily tell if the pseudomonas strain is sensitive or resistant to antibiotics.